There really is nothing more important than, than Jesus coming into the world. In fact, if we, we read there in the book of Genesis, chapter 3, verse 15, you know the story. Adam and Eve were given an opportunity to follow God or not follow God so they could be free moral agents. They could choose whether they wanted to love the Lord and do according to his will or not. And we know how it ended. They chose poorly. But then God gave them the promise that he would send a Messiah. And that's been understood for for generations. The rabbis all understood that was talking about the Messiah. The early church understood that was talking about the Messiah, where it says that that, uh, the seed of the woman will come and that, that he will crush the serpent's head, but the serpent will bite his heel. That was talking about the Messiah. And so we've, we've seen through Scripture, the, the big picture of Scripture is that this Messiah would come. And the, the, the concentric circles, the, the bullseye keeps getting smaller and smaller until we get to the Messiah. And so we start with through the seed of the woman, then through Abraham. Well, then it goes through, through uh, Noah and through his son Shem. And then it goes through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And it goes through Judah. And then finally it goes through David. And then finally, we get up to the book of Matthew, and there he is. This is the, the, the one that they've all been waiting for, this promised Messiah. This really is the, the turning point in human history. Because you see, God had given Adam and Eve everything. They, could, they had entire dominion of the earth, and yet they gave it up. And they had forfeited what he had given them until the time that the Messiah would come, and he would put things right. And so this is a very, very exciting point. You know, the rabbis, they talked about dividing the world into six or uh, 6,000 years, followed by a, a literal 1,000 years. We talked about that uh, a couple of times ago that I was here. But they were looking forward to this messianic figure. And they said that the first 2,000 years of human history would be a time of chaos. And then it would be followed by the time of law. And then the last 2,000 years, or the, the third set of 2,000 years, would be the time of the Messiah. And lo and behold, the last 2,000 years have indeed been the time of the Messiah. These have been the time of the church age, where every pr- person from every nation and tribe and tongue can come and have a relationship with this living God who sent his son, Jesus, to pay the price for our sins. And we know that that is the Messiah. He is the promised one. And so they understood that. So now we're just going back to about 2,000 years ago, and we're seeing that here is now the promise of the one that God had promised. So here, Matthew chapter 2, verse 1. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. Now, first of all, the name of Jesus is Yeshua, salvation. He is the one that God had promised, and they were so looking forward to him. Now, there were others that had the name Jesus. It wasn't uh, exclusive to our Lord, but it was still a special name. And we see, we see uh, hints of that in the name of Joshua, Yehoshua, uh, which is Yahweh saves. And so finally, by the time of our Lord, his, the, the name had, had shortened just a little bit to Yeshua, salvation. And we see that word salvation throughout Scripture. We see a, a whole bunch in the book of Isaiah talking about God's salvation, that uh, how blessed is God's salvation. And true indeed that his very name means salvation. And of course, Christ means the anointed one, Mashiach. And so he's now, he's born in Bethlehem, the city of David. He's born in the house of bread. Jesus would become the bread that came down from heaven. He's the, the bread of life. He's the one that we take in and we, through him we have life. We have a new, uh, where we are made new uh, through, through receiving Jesus into our hearts. And, but notice here that it's in the days of Herod the king. Herod was a pretty bad guy. I mean, as far as bad guys go, he was a bad guy. If you want to talk about a terrorist, Herod was it. He uh, was not only mean, he was vicious. He killed uh, many of his wives. He killed his own sons. This guy was paranoid. And so this was not a great time to be born, especially considering that he was a usurper to the throne. You see, he wasn't, he wasn't born into the line of David. He uh, had come from the Eudemans, and he had basically, uh, through bribery, taken the throne. And that is how he was on it. But he was never secure in his position. And he always thought somebody was going to try to take it. 
and rightfully so. I mean, he again, he was a bad guy, but this paranoia kept feeding itself until he had killed everybody that he loved. Even his dear, dear wife, uh, Miriam, he, he killed her as well. And so he didn't trust anybody. So this is important background information to consider that where Jesus is being born and who is king at this point. But notice here also, these, these uh, wise men from the east, they came to Jerusalem. They're seeking the king. Now we all sing, we three kings of Orient are. Well, I hate to burst your bubble, but it may not have been three. It could have been at least two. We know it was at least two. It's in the plural, so it had to be at least two. But more than likely, it was a huge retinue. Now, we don't know how many kings or, or wise men. These were uh, the very studious uh, knowers, this astrologers, but they were, they were charting the stars. They were looking for these types of signs. They were looking uh, for uh, what the heavens could tell them about the coming of the Messiah. And so these guys were coming, looking for, this, for the king. And they know that he's supposed to come because they, we, they say, we've seen his star in the east and we've come to worship him. How would these men from the east, now we're guessing that they came from the area of Babylon. That's just a guess. We're not sure. They could have come as, from as far away as Arabia. Uh, considering the gifts that they brought, they may have come as, from as far away as Arabia. But it's, it is at least possible that when it says they came from the east, it's talking about the city of Babylon. The city of Babylon was still in existence. We know that there, were, uh, there was still a large population of Jews who were living in Babylon. We have something called the Babylonian Talmud. And the Babylonian Talmud is uh, the collection of the, the Jewish uh, teachings from around this time. And so there was still a, a very big population of Jews there. They easily could have heard through the teaching of other Jews. They may have, uh, they may have been sort of descendants in a line uh, from uh, Daniel. And so they probably had more than enough information. Well, how could they have known just from reading the Old Testament about a star? Well, we read in the book of Numbers 24, 17, if you recall, Balaam. Balaam was a prophet who was in it for the money. And uh, this king Balaam, or Balak, excuse me, wanted to curse the children of Israel as they were coming through his land. And so he hired Balaam to go out and curse them. And it's a very uh, very funny story. You should check it out sometime. Numbers 24. It's the only time where a, uh, a donkey uh, truly makes a fool of uh, the one sitting on him. Uh, God opens his mouth, and uh, they have this whole conversation. And you've got to wonder, now, who's, who's the dumber guy here? Who's more obstinate, the donkey or the person sitting on him? But uh, that's what greed can do to you. But he finally comes, and he's not able to curse the children of Israel, though he wants to. He wants to get paid. Uh, he eventually will find another way to curse them, which is by telling Balak, here's what you're going to do. Go and have the young girls, the prostitutes, go and seduce them, and God himself will strike him. And it worked, unfortunately. But here in chapter 24, he, he wants to go out and prophesy against, against Israel to curse them, but he's not able to do so. And God gives him this prophecy. He says, I see him now. I see him, but not now. Behold, I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob. A scepter shall rise out of Israel. Now, in the Talmud, they understood that this was talking about the Messiah. In fact, uh, not the Talmud, excuse me, the Targumim. The Targumim are the Aramaic translations of the Old Testament. And so there we find that they've actually inserted the word Messiah. And so they understood this was talking about the Messiah. They knew that a star would come. And here we have literally... A star, this is not just some figurative uh, terminology to talk about, oh, how great he will be, but there's actually a star that's going to precede the coming of the Messiah. And incidentally, uh, it, it's just a, a fascinating point to ponder when it says that when Jesus comes back, when he, when he has his second coming, and it says uh, that appear, there appeared the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then the Son of Man with great power and glory. Well, could it be, and again, we don't know, but I'm just throwing this out there for something to think about, that it could be that that sign of the Son of Man maybe is a star. Maybe there's going to be another type of star that will appear. And so here we have the star that will come out of Jacob. Now there's going to be a later Messiah, a false Messiah that will come. He's by the name of Bar Kokhba. Bar Kokhba means son of the star. You know about the the revolt against the Romans in 70 AD. Well, there was a second Jewish revolt from 132 to 135 AD. 
And uh, Hadrian, the, the Roman Caesar, had prohibited that the Jews would circumcise their children. And, uh, you know, you just can't be Jewish and not circumcise your children. That's not going to happen. So they revolted again, and led by this guy named Bar Kokhba, again, son of the star, that was the name that he was given. His real name was Bar Kosova, but uh, one of the, the famous rabbis, Rabbi Akiva, uh, started to call him Bar Kokhba. And again, it was in in uh, relation to this prophecy here, saying this is the Messiah. Well, of course, you know, the, the Jews got squashed and they were told never to come back to Jerusalem on pain of death, so don't you dare do that. But they had these messianic expectations. They knew that this was the time there around that, that first century. That was the time when the Messiah was supposed to come. And they missed the first one. They missed the first one so tragically. And so they, would, they were willing to believe in this guy named Bar Kokhba because they were so so convinced that his number one and only priority was really to kick out the Romans. And so they were willing to believe a lie rather than to see the one that fulfilled all those prophecies, uh, unfortunately. But back to our text here in Matthew chapter 2. So the wise men, they've come from the east. Where is he who was born king of the Jews? We've seen his star and we've come to worship him. These guys didn't need a lot of information. They didn't know, well, you know, what's this guy like? What's this Jesus person like? Or what is, we don't even know his name. Is he in a nice palace? A king should be somehow adorned with gold and silver and many, many attendants. But we're going to read at the end that all they find is just Mary, his mother, and Joseph attending him. He's in a, uh, just some very uh, basic place. He's in a, a home at this point. He's not in the manger still. But there's not this huge retinue of people that are serving him. We know that this was Jesus' purpose. Jesus came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many, is what he tells us there in Mark 10, 45. We also read in, in Philippians chapter 2, beautiful passage Paul tells us, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God has also highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord to the glory of God the Father. These, these magi, these wise men that were coming from the east were coming to seek the Lord. They didn't know who to expect. They weren't going expecting to receive anything in return. They were going, they were bringing gifts. They wanted to go and worship him. Didn't matter what his social standing was. It didn't matter if people liked him or not. It didn't matter if, if he could promise them. They, they went and they, they received nothing in return. And you know, as, as we look at Christmas and how it develops, Christmas has really turned from something where we come to worship the Lord and it's become to some, turned into something where it's all about the shopping, it's about the consumer it's about, uh, you know, having the sales up at the end of the year. And we always hear these reports, well, it looks like sales might be down this year. And uh, everybody's worried about the economy. And, you know, you need to go out and shop just to be a good American. And, but, you know, it's, it's not about that, is it? And I'd like to think that most of us in here have that in mind. But it's a good reminder. It's a good reminder for me that it's not about the gifts. It's not about all the parties. And, you know, we enjoy some of that stuff. We went and saw the boat parade last night. That was fun. The kids liked it. But that had nothing to do with Jesus. In fact, I think I saw, you know, one nativity scene on a boat. Other than that, it was all about uh, people had, you know, loud music on and pretty lights. But Jesus was in nothing of that. It's not about snowmen. We're in California, after all. Do you see any snowmen around here? It's, it's become something so fake, really. And we have to constantly guard against that. Now, we're here in the world. We can't really get out, can we? We're stuck, you know, for a time. So we have to live in this world, but... We're still not of this world. And this is where I just, I'm on a campaign. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. God bless you. Because I want to remind people it's about Jesus. It's not about all the stuff. And I think that we can easily fall into that trap. But the wise men, they came to worship him. Again, receiving nothing in return. They, they went and found a little tiny baby. What could the little baby Jesus do at that point? Did, was he actually sitting there on, with Mary with his hands up and you know, giving them the good job? No, he wasn't doing that. He was a little baby. He was helpless. He could do nothing. And so 
that, is, that should be our attitude as well. Lord, we come to serve you, not to receive anything, because we are unworthy servants. And yet, and yet, you didn't consider it robbery. The ESV says that he didn't hold on to, he didn't uh, hostily retain that equality with God. This, this whole idea of robbery there in the, in the text of Philippians, it's a little bit difficult to understand, but really this idea that he didn't hold on to it tenaciously. He was willing to let go of that. Think of Jesus setting aside, just like a king has his glorious robes on. They're rightfully his, you see. You see, he was born as a king, and by his very virtue of who he was, he had the right to wear these glorious robes and put on that splendor. And yet Jesus, by his own free will, chose to take that off, so to speak. He disrobed himself of that glory, and he put it down for a a time. And again, just like a king, we've probably all seen in the movies and such where the king will go out in stealth just to see what his people are doing and he dresses up as a commoner. It's the same idea. Where, where Jesus came as a commoner, he disguised himself by taking off that brilliance, that glory, the, the Shekinah, the Shekinah glory. He set that aside for a time. And he was born in this little, dirty, disgusting manger. You know, a manger is where the animals actually eat. We had animals when I was a kid and that's not a very nice place. I mean, I wouldn't put my head in that thing. They got all, you know, I mean, animals, you know, they do their thing. They they start eating, and it gets all messy, and their saliva gets in there. And, you know, it's just kind of this nasty, kind of muddy stuff. Would you want to put your baby in that? No. This isn't a place for a king. This isn't a place for the creator of the universe. And yet Jesus was willing to humble himself so much. We really don't have any concept of how how much he humbled himself. You know, if you and I were to, you know, well, you and my wife, I should say, my wife and I have a baby and we were to put it in a, a manger, that would still be disgusting. But you know, I'm not that high up. But for the king of the universe to come all the way down, you see, for a, a, a natural human born baby to go and be put in a manger, the, the step isn't that big. But God is way up here and he came way down here, far, further down than most of us are ever willing to go. And he did that so that he could take up our sins and declare us righteous by dying for our sins. Well, verse 3, when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. Boy, there's an understatement. Again, Herod, this guy who's so paranoid about his throne, he's just looking everywhere. He'll kill anybody, obviously proven from the text. And sometimes you have skeptics out there, oh, this Herod guy wasn't really that bad. Listen, Herod was a great builder, but that's about it. He was a good builder. He, well, he did manage to keep his throne, so I guess he, he, was, he was good at that. But the, think of the, the price that he paid. He killed everyone around him that he loved. That's just a madman. And so the idea of killing all the little children in Bethlehem is not beyond this guy at all. It's completely consistent with his character. And so when you hear, when, when he heard that there was someone who was actually born king of the Jews. That had him a little bit nervous. And trust me, if you know Herod, you're going to be nervous too, because this means that heads could fly. This means that there could be trouble ahead. And so everyone's concerned. But think about it. These guys are coming into Jerusalem, these, these wise men, and, and probably all of their, their helpers. I mean, we, we probably have, I would guess, you know, 50 to 100 people would not be uh, inconsistent. And, and that was kind of a big deal. You know, they didn't... Uh, they didn't have these things happen every day. And so to have, you know, some, some special people uh, show up in town still would have, would have made the news, so to speak. And so everybody, wow, who are these guys? What are they doing? You know, where they're coming and bringing all this stuff. What, what's, all, what's up with that? And so they go to Herod and they ask, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? Because we've seen him. And then Herod, in verse 4, you see that, And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where Christ was to be born. So Herod is quite concerned. Now, a king was supposed to write for himself a copy of the book of the law. And as far as we can tell, this probably never happened. Maybe David did it. It's quite possible that David actually wrote his own personal copy of the book of the law. And God did that so that, well, there'd be more copies around, for one. Secondly, that the king would internalize his law. And we see from all the Psalms that David delighted in the law of the Lord. And this is talking about the first five books of Moses. So David had a very good understanding, and he loved it. He thought God's word was just beautiful and wonderful. 
But after that, we don't really have any evidence that they were doing that. In fact, it got so bad that one day Josiah uh, and Josiah's servants, they find the book of the law. It's been lost. And so you can see the, the progression that they have been losing the law. But had they known this, they would have known that, uh, that there would be a star preceding it. If there's a star in the sky, Herod and his people should have seen this. In fact, all of Jerusalem should have seen this star. Now, what, it, what, what was the star? That's a real good question. Some people suggest that it was a, um, uh, the planets Jupiter and Venus coming together in the night sky so that it looked like the brightest star in the heavens. And there's a very, uh, very good case for that. And I think that's a, a real possibility. But ultimately, we're not sure. It, it may have been something completely supernatural, some type of a, an orb of light flying around. That's, you know, that's a possibility, though I would probably go for the, uh, the, the two planets um, coming together to look like a really bright star. And there's a whole bunch of interesting uh, astrological, astronomical stuff that, that talks about the retrograde motion and how it could have appeared that it was moving in the sky. But ultimately, we're not sure. So, but again, there's a star in the heavens. They should have seen it. They should have known, hey, this is it. They should have known from their own writings. You know what? Let's see, 2,000 plus 2,000. Hey, this is about the time that the Messiah should come. They had the writings of David or Daniel, excuse me. They had the writings of Daniel. They could have seen that from the going forth, the order of going forth to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the time of Messiah the Prince when he would be cut off. There would be seven weeks and 62 weeks, which is equal to 483 years. So they should have known that, hey, we're in the, we're in the ballpark here. We're right in the right season for this to happen. And of course, there was tremendous amount of messianic expectation. We see this in the <clears throat> in the writings of Qumran that they were looking forward to the Messiah. We see it uh, everywhere that they were looking forward to this one who would come. It was just in the air. They were so excited. And yet, when they hear the report of these guys, well, we've come to worship this one who's been, been born king of the Jews. You see, there had not actually been a king in the house of David. He, remember, Bethlehem. That's the birthplace of David. That's the birthplace of Jesse. That's the birthplace of Boaz. This is a very important place. And so it's clearly that, that the Messiah had to come from Bethlehem. In fact, it, the text is going to go on and tell us why. And if we read there in verse 5, So they said to him in Bethlehem of Judea, For thus it is written by the prophet, But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Ju Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people. Now this is coming from Micah 5.2, book of Micah 5.2, talking about the coming of the Messiah. And Micah says, but you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel. And that's where the text in Matthew stops, but it goes on. It says, whose goings forth are from of old, from everlasting Again, if we look in the Targumim, those Aramaic translations, we see that they inserted the word Messiah. That's pretty exciting. So again, they understood this was clearly talking about the Messiah. And yet when they have the own report of the, the wise men coming, these Gentiles who are coming, and say, we saw this person come, we saw his star, where is he? There seems to be no excitement in Jerusalem. And so the word there is uh, from, the, from who's... who's uh, whose goings forth are from of old, from everlasting, from everlasting. It's the same word there in the Aramaic, uh, the Aramaic translations. We find it's the same word that they use to talk about the uh, e eternity, uh, talking about God. It's also there in, in Genesis 1. Uh, of course, this one was written in Hebrew. But again, we find that, that the terminology that is used is talking about a Messiah, one who would come from the heavens down to the earth. You see, one of the, the major problems that, that uh, the Jews have about Jesus is they say, you Christians have taken a man and made him into a god. Now, if that were the case, we'd be in big trouble. If we were worshiping someone who was born as just a regular person, and then he became a god, I would throw that out too, and I hope you would too. But that's not what we're talking about here. We're not talking about someone who was truly inspired. This is a really inspirational kind of man, and you know he sort of elevated himself to godhood status. We're not talking about that. We're talking about God, the second person of the Trinity, who, again, took off that glory that was rightfully his. He set it aside, and he humbled himself, and he became a man. He, he uh, dwelt among us, John tells us. And so this... 
this idea that we're worshiping somebody who started as a man and became a god is completely false and erroneous. We don't believe that. We believe that he started as God. He was always God. He never ceased being God. And yet, for a time, he took on flesh. He took on humanity and became one of us. You see, now that's truly amazing. That is glorious. And so, again, we're not worshiping a man, but we're worshiping God himself. And in the text there in Isaiah, excuse me, in, in Micah, it's very clear that's talking about someone who is divine, who, whose origins are not of this world. They're completely from a different, a different time. In fact, uh, the word there, uh, it says from the days of eternity, and that's talking about uh, eternity past. And so it's talking about uh, someone who is completely uh, different, uh, has a, 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 a uh, nature altogether different from our own. But, but uh, Matthew says that he will shepherd my people. He will shepherd my people. Jesus himself called, him, called himself the good shepherd. This idea of a shepherd is a, a beautiful picture. It's interesting. The Egyptians used the, the term of shepherd. They had their flail and they had their staff and those were or their crook. And those were things that they used to, to show themselves to be this good and, and rightful king that was taking care of their people. But they were really nothing of the sort. The, the ancient Egyptians were concerned about their own dynasties and their own power, and they could do anything they wanted. And, and uh, I'm sure they had their, their moments here and there, but by and large, they were not good kings. But Jesus is just the opposite. He is that good king. He is that good shepherd, and he's willing to lay down his life for you and I. And, of course, that's what he did, and that was his very purpose in coming to this earth. And it really wasn't so much to teach, teach us good things and how to be nice to each other. His main purpose in coming was to lay down his life as a ransom for many. That was the main purpose. That's what he was all about. The other things, of course, were important, but they weren't the main focus. They weren't his reason for being here. It was to come and to lay his life down. Verse 7, Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared, and he sent, to, sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the young child, and when you have found him, bring back word to me, that I may come and worship him also. So Herod gets this secret meeting. I wonder where this, you know, when did he show up? And he's trying to determine, uh, determine uh, you know, just when this, uh, this child had come. And if we, we look here in verse 16, it says, Then Herod, when he saw that he was deceived by the wise men, was exceedingly angry, and he sent forth and put to death all the male children who were in Bethlehem and in all its dis, uh, districts from two years old and under, according to the time which he had determined from the wise men. So he carefully searched. So when did you see this guy? When did you see the star? How long ago was it? He's trying to determine exactly how old this child must be. So we don't know exactly how long Jesus is there. Again, the wise men show up. It's not the same night. Uh, we, you know, in our nativity scenes, we have the shepherds and we have the wise men. Those are really wrong. Uh, the very night that he was born, only the, sh only the shepherds showed up. The wise men appeared sometime later. We don't know exactly how much later, but it wasn't the very night that he was born because they're already in a house at this point. They're in a, a stable uh, dwelling place. It's not still, they're not still in the, sh in the, uh, in the stable. Um, so, you know, Herod being as crazy as he was, he probably thinks, well, I'll just, you know, two years and under, I'm sure to get him. Uh, that way, you know, I won't take any chances of missing anybody. Uh, now, how many children were killed? Sometimes we think it must have been thousands and thousands. Some studies have been done suggesting that it may have been as few as like 19 or 20. You consider that this was a small town, the number of people with young children at that point. Uh, you know, maybe it was 40. It's still tragic. There's no question about that. But it wasn't the hundreds or thousands of, of people that sometimes we imagine. Uh, but still a, a very, very sad thing. Very consistent with who Herod was. Uh, we could easily imagine that he would do this in order to, uh, to make sure that he would be uh, on the throne. But notice Herod. He says, go and, and seek out the child that, uh, that I may come and worship him also. We find so often that there are a lot of imposters. They want to put on a good face, a good show. Yeah, I want to worship Jesus. Uh, you know, I like Jesus. He's, uh, he's good. You know, show me how to do it or, 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 you know, what's up with this Christianity stuff. But people have a lot of uh, bad motives. And it's really sad when people that should know better, Herod should have known better, but he was more interested in his own power, his own position. He wanted to safeguard that which 
that what he had. You know, I think that Herod could have come clean at this point. He could have said, wow, king of the Jews? Really? Okay. He could have come and truly worshiped him, bowed down to him. God gives everyone an opportunity, and yet so many reject it because of their own interests. You know, this life, it's so quick, it's so fast, and then it's over. And Herod, he had his day in the sun. He, he maintained his power until the very end, but he had a tragic end, uh, a very painful end from what we read. It seems that he had some kind of worms or something. But where is he now? And someday he will bow his knee and he will confess with his tongue that Jesus is the Lord. And you see, if people will only do it now, they'll save themselves much pain in this life and a lot of pain in the world to come. And so as we go throughout this Christmas season, let's be intent on reminding people, hey, it's about Jesus. It's not just about talking about the baby Jesus. People can kind of stomach the baby Jesus. Well, we're okay with him. But when he grows up, we don't like him so much. But he didn't stay a baby. He became a man. He became uh, the one who would go and teach. And of course, he was fulfilling his destiny. He fulfilled what he had come to do. Again, Jesus came into this world from someplace else. His point of origin was not here in Matthew chapter 2. His point of origin was from the days of old. In other words, he doesn't have an origin. He is God. He's that second person in the Trinity. He's the one who spoke the world into existence. He's the one that said, let there be light, and there was light. He's the one that was there with the Father at all times, if you can call it time. And so Herod is a, an example of many who who pretend to put on that that. That Christmas spirit, oh yes, we like Jesus, we sing a couple songs, maybe we go to church, but we're not really interested in Jesus. We're interested in our own empires, we're interested in our own power, and uh, we need to be careful that we watch out for those people, and we ourselves need to be careful. We ourselves need to be careful that we're not just putting on a show, that we're not just trying to get something from Jesus, but we want to give. We're servants of the Most High, and whatever He gives to us are, are gracious gifts. We don't deserve anything. And yet he gives us so much. Verse 9, when they, had, when they heard the king, they departed. And behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them, till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So there they see the star again. They're excited because they know that that is leading them to the one that they've been seeking. And you see, when Herod and, and those in Jerusalem got news of this, they were terrified. But those who are seeking him, when they see the sign, they're terribly excited. And it's really interesting that when, it, it, we, as we read there in, in the book of Revelation, that when all these things begin to happen, what are people doing? They're hiding themselves from the face of the Lamb. They don't want him to come. This is a terrifying thing. But for us, the coming of the Lord is a great deal of excitement because we know that we're going to be with our king face to face. And so it's all a matter of perspective. For some, the coming of the Lord is a dreadful thing. And they want nothing to do with him because they know that there's a day of reckoning that's coming. But if you've put yourself right with the Lord, if you've received him as your king, if you have, in a sense, worshipped him and bowed down and fallen on your face and say, oh, Lord Jesus, I don't deserve anything good from you. I'm just coming to give whatever I have. I'm laying down everything before you. Imagine you see a little baby in front of you. He's, again, in no place special. He's not in a palace. He's not attended by thousands of servants. There's no army that's uh, standing there at attention. There aren't even the angels in the sky at this point. They just come and they find Jesus, the one they've been looking for, and they rejoice and they fall on their faces. Grown men in, in front of a baby. Can you imagine? And yet they're so excited. They're so delighted. They're overfilled with joy that they find the one that they have been seeking. <clears throat> and when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now, there's been, of course, a lot of speculation as to what gold, frankincense, and myrrh actually represent. Uh, bottom line, we're not absolutely sure. It's suggested that the frankincense and myrrh were used to embalm people, and that is a possibility. There's no question about that. But we don't know that that was specifically what those were for. But these were, these were precious gifts. Uh, we, we know that these, uh, or frankincense and myrrh especially, originated there in the east, probably in Arabia, uh, perhaps in the area of Babylon. And so they were bringing precious things to him. And these 
certainly in a, in a practical sense would have served uh, Joseph and Mary as they, as they fled to, uh, to Egypt, and that would give them something to live on. Uh, they had some money that they would need. But certainly these are treasures for a king. These are, are great things. When a, a lesser comes to a superior, it was the custom to bring gifts. And again, we just see that these men, they came with, receiving, uh, with the desire to receive nothing in return. They came to give to the king of kings, the one that they were told um, would come. And you have to admire their faith. You have to truly admire their faith because they didn't see any signs. They didn't see Jesus overthrow the Romans. They didn't see him in any of his glory. And yet they said, this is the one because we, we saw it in the scriptures. We saw the star. That's enough. So little. And we, we kind of think about Thomas, how Thomas wasn't willing to believe uh, the other disciples and he had to see for himself. And Jesus says, you know, Thomas, go ahead and touch my hands and my side and, and my wounds. And says, but blessed are those who believe and yet have not seen and it kind of makes me think of us that, you know, we've never seen the Lord. We've never smelled him or touched him or heard him audibly. I don't think most of us, at least I haven't. And yet we have the word of God. We, ha- we know what he's done in our hearts. Uh, we see many things that have been fulfilled. But sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it's, you start thinking, is it really going to happen this way? And you know, I can be filled with doubts too. And I, I feel that the, 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 the enemy's working on me. Doug, don't believe it. Doug, don't believe it. Hey, shut up. Shut up. You see, we have so many historical facts. And when your faith is tested, you're going to need that, those strong pieces of evidence to help you hold in there. Because our faith is truly attacked. And if, if, it, if there's nothing historical about it, if we're just believing a fairy tale, then people are going to fall away. But this isn't a fairy tale. This isn't just a nice children's story. I could think of a lot better children's story. I mean, how many children's stories should really have death and all this, you know, killing of babies and stuff? That's not a nice children's story. So... This is something that, that is talking about the first coming of the great king. He came first to pay the price of our sins. He came as a humble, little, helpless, defenseless baby, born in a stinky stable with animals. As much as our cute little storybooks make it nice and all these things, but it was not a nice place to be. Uh, whether it was in the winter or not, whether it was December 25th, probably not, probably in September, but it was still would have been cold at night. Not a nice place to be born. And yet Jesus did all that so that he could relate to you and I. Because we truly are in the gutter, aren't we? You start to think about it. There's really nothing that's good in our hearts. We're desperately wicked. I know that about myself. That I Sometimes I start thinking, you know, I'm getting a little better. <laughs> and the Lord reminds me, no, you're not, Doug. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Lord. Oh, it's so good. So good that he paid the price for our sins. That he was willing to lay it all aside and to come. And so... As we approach Christmas, I encourage myself, I encourage you, it's not about the gifts, it's about what you can give to the Lord. Give your heart to the Lord, first of all. If you've not received the Lord, this is the day to do it. He's really given us the greatest gift that we could ever, ever imagine. Peace with him now, and eternal life forever and ever and ever. And you see, we even get thrown, uh, thrones that we get to sit on during the millennium. We even get crowns. We don't deserve any of that stuff. Yet Jesus did it because he loved us so much. We're told that God demonstrates his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You know, if he was willing to do all that when we were up, we we're down here shaking our fists, I want nothing to do with you, God. I hate you. And he was willing to die in our place. We ought to be humbled and just say, wow, he was willing to do anything for me. And so now go boldly to his throne of grace. Don't let anything hold you back. God did everything necessary for us to have a relationship with him. Jesus is the fulfillment of the promise given to Abraham, uh, to Adam and Eve. <clears throat> He's the promised one. He's the, the, uh, the Messiah that was promised to come and to take away our sins. And the good news is he's coming back soon. He came once as a humble servant. He's coming back as a mighty king. He's coming back as the Lion of Judah. And I tell you what, there's going to be truly hell to pay when he comes back. But if you receive him now, oh, it'll be joy and bliss. And we'll get, to, we'll get to come back with the Lord when he comes to take care of those that have denied him. And we get to be the cheerleaders. Go, Jesus. Go, Jesus. So I encourage you, put your trust in him if you haven't. And if you have, get out there and share your faith. Share the good news, especially now. People are open to it more than ever this time of year. This is the time to say, you know what? Why did Jesus come? Share with him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your love toward us. We thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for sending the Lord Jesus that 
uh, that he was willing to set aside his glory for a time to pay the price of our sins. Lord, we rejoice in that. And just like those wise men, Lord, we want to we wanna bow down and fall on our faces before you because we know that in and of ourselves there's nothing good, that you really didn't have to save us. You could have left us rightfully and righteously in our sins, and yet you loved us so much that you were willing to take our sins upon you. We thank you for this. We thank you for Christmas, Lord, that it is a time to celebrate your first coming. And so, Lord, as we celebrate your first coming, we think about your second coming. Help us keep our eyes on you to not lose heart, to not lose sight of what you're doing. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.